Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Empowering Patients as Palliative Care Ambassadors, Experiences, Tips, and Templates. A few housekeeping items as we get started here today. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email after today's webinar with information to access the recording and the slides. So look for that in the next few days. While we're talking, please go ahead and post questions in the chat or Q&A box. We do plan to have time for some discussion at the end uh, when we will get to those questions. So thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. I'm Judy Thomas. CEO of the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. And the coalition has been around for 20 years. And our vision is that people of all ages can live well in the face of serious illness. And we do that by promoting conversations uh, about serious illness as a normal part of everyday life and palliative care as a normal part of our healthcare system. We really want to serve as a big tent for all the voices coming together, including patients and just regular old people that we all are um, outside of our professional jobs, that we feel like the movement is stronger when we have all voices around the table. So I want to acknowledge PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, who has funded the work that we're going to be talking about here today. PCORI was founded in 2010 by Congress as a way to engage the patient perspective in comparing the effectiveness of different medical interventions. And PCORI started a, um, one of their streams of their work is Eugene Washington Engagement Awards, uh, which this work was conducted under. So we really appreciate and want to thank PCORI for the grant funding that made this work possible. The Engagement Awards focus on engaging patients and caregivers and other stakeholders um, in very robust participation uh, in healthcare and in research. And just a quick disclaimer that the views presented on this webinar are solely the responsibility of the presenters and not PCORI. Here's a little bit more information and background on PCORI if you want to check them out or if you're not familiar with them. So the goals of this project here that we're talking about um, that the coalition received and worked on with the folks that you'll get a chance to hear from today was to engage patients as ambassadors and spokespersons for palliative care. And so the basic structure of this two-year process was to recruit and train just a, a handful of people that we call e-patient ambassadors to help with developing and disseminating information about palliative care, advanced care planning, person-centered care, largely through social media. And then to create and disseminate a toolkit of the best practices to help others do similar efforts um, and promote this information or on other topics. So the heart of our webinar today is really this chance to hear from our five e-patient ambassadors, who I am very excited to, uh, if you haven't met them before, to introduce you to them and to give the chance to hear about their experience over the last couple of years with this work. So first, as you can see on the slide here on the left, is Grace Cordovano from Grace Cordovano from West Caldwell, New Jersey. Grace is a patient advocate, um, both personally and professionally. She founded Enlightening Results, a private personalized patient advocacy service that specializes in the cancer care. And she was really activated and called to this work through her own experience growing up. Next to Grace is Sharon Hall from Cumming, Georgia. When Sharon's husband was diagnosed with frontal temporal degeneration, she couldn't find the resources or support that she needed to best care for him. So she had to create it, those things on her own. And she has been helping those recently diagnosed with early onset dementia and their caregivers. That has become her passion and mission. In the middle, we have Mary Millard from Prairieville, Louisiana. Mary lives with an antibiotic-resistant superbug. 
that she acquired, ironically, during a life-saving hospital procedure. And Mary is not able to be with us live today. She will part be participating by a recording. Next to Mary is Shelley Reinhardt from Rancho Cucamonga, California. Shelley's experience as a caregiver for her brother during his battle with cancer, during which palliative care services were never offered, activated her as a palliative care champion because she wonders how things would have been different for her brother, herself, and her family had palliative care been offered to him. And on the far right, we have Celine Seltzer from Ashland, Oregon. Celine is a board-certified clinical healthcare chaplain who's experienced personal illness as well as caring for family members through their illness and dying process. She's specially attuned to psychosocial, spiritual needs and their impact on individuals, their care partners, and healthcare teams. Celine, like Mary, unfortunately is unable to be with us live today, so you will be hearing from her by a recording. This is a graphic that we developed to help kind of give people a sense of what we call the e-patient ecosystem. So e-patients are patients who are engaged and activated and involved in their own care. Now, the level of engagement does vary. So you can read here at the bottom. The bottom part of this lower triangle is kind of basic online engagement. So people who um, have a medical situation, they go online and they Google it and they get more information and are very just actively gathering information, which we know is pretty common these days um, as the internet becomes more and more part of our everyday life. Above that are people who are what we call moderately engaged. So they're a little bit more active, not just gathering information, um, but really being a part of the conversation and communicating with others um, online or through other mechanisms. And that's kind of where we say that and the top part of, you can see in the red are what we consider really the thought leaders of the e-patient ecosystem. So these are leaders in organizations like the Society for Participatory Medicine. Um, they may be leaders and very engaged with PCORI as serving on advisory committees, um, having their own blogs, their own websites, really actively driving that conversation. And that's kind of who we're talking about here today. Our e-patient ambassadors definitely fall into that group. And then as kind of the companion to this, we also have at the top our, our healthcare providers who are getting engaged as well in these new ways of communicating with patients uh, online and through tweet chats, through um, support groups that are visiting or um, meeting online and other mechanisms like that. And you can see kind of that lower part of that triangle in purple, we're calling them e-doctors, e-healthcare providers. They're like the thought leaders as well, flip side of our e-patient thought leaders, the doctors that are really proactively out there driving this conversation online. So that's kind of just an overview of how we see this e-patient ecosystem. So the coalition's journey with working with e-patients started several years ago when we started to realize that there was a growing body of patients who were really actively engaged in a new way um, that opens up through the internet um, to drive their care, supporting others with care, and driving conversations about how we can improve our healthcare system. And we first started by getting funds so that we could provide scholarships for e-patients to participate in our summit. And we, that has become a very important part of our summit every year since then. Uh, we find that there's lots of value of having patients intermix with the other attendees at the conference. And then also, because they do tend to be active online, helps to spread the good word and the learnings that are happening at the summit with a much larger audience. So, a few years ago, or early on, what they told us is that they felt that the information that was out there about palliative care, whether it's online or through conversations or wherever information is coming from, that it really seemed to reflect the provider perspective, that it wasn't capturing the authentic voice 
and perspective of patients and caregivers. So that's what spurred us to put together this project, pursue the funding through PCORI for this work here. And it's my pleasure now to turn this over to our e-patient ambassadors so you can hear from them directly about what they've been up to and what their experiences and lessons learned have been. And I'll pass it over to Grace. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was an amazing opportunity to have this chance to collaborate both with the ambassadors that were selected as well as the entire CCC team. Um, my day to day, as you mentioned, so I'm a board certified patient advocate and to give a little bit of a glimpse of what I do and why I was so propelled to this, I work on a daily basis with patients and their families in the oncology space, helping patients, navigate both their cancer diagnosis as well as the chaos that is our healthcare system. And I'm in northern New Jersey, which is now in a hotspot COVID-19 area. So as you can imagine, the context of the work that we were doing here as e-patient ambassadors was significantly amplified when we started running into challenges due to COVID-19 and how care is being distributed or given. Um, one of the breaking points to apply for this research project was I remember being on a phone call trying to connect a patient with palliative care and the person on the phone at a local hospital, which is a center of excellence for cancer care, asked me if the patient was terminal and asked and told me that they didn't have any other palliative care except invasive options. And I, I just got off the phone feeling completely de deflated and I applied for this opportunity and I'm so glad I did because it has so greatly opened my eyes to the strength and benefit of palliative care. And now I am armed with many different resources. I have referred to the website and all of the different toolkits that are on there repeatedly and regularly, not just connecting patients and their families to it, but literally sharing it with my colleagues in medicine to try to expand awareness about palliative care, end of life care, shared decision making in these sometimes difficult conversations and spaces. I approach this in a multifaceted way. I convey the basic information in conversations about advanced directives and end-of-life care planning in the context of cancer care with patients and their families, often having a unique separate conversation, candid but compassionate conversation with patients. But on the side, I would have care partners and families, sons, daughters, parents, aunts, uncles, primary care partners who may be colleagues and friends, reach out looking for more information so that they could be informed when a delicate conversation and opportunity would arise on what end of life care would look like for their loved one. And it was constantly pointing them to the website because it's so rich with workshops, webinars, shared decision making tools. Um, going broader, uh, I often do workshops in the local community. So sharing what an advanced directive is and and how to approach these conversations with the local community, emphasizing that everyone should start having these conversations because it's only too early um, until it's too late. I brought these conversations about advanced care planning and palliative care to many digital health and digital tech conferences because we're missing this opportunity. The only thing certain in life is that we're all going to die. And here we have these opportunities now where we're seeing telehealth, telemedicine. How can we bring technology to make these conversations more accessible and best supported for anyone involved, no matter if they're a cancer diagnosis or any chronic illness or a colleague in medicine or a health professional that, or even any person that's looking to support their loved ones, their aging parents or family members who may have a complex or chronic medical condition. I've started blogging a lot more about it, writing to share the information across different avenues, speaking about it and making sure to weave in advanced care planning, end of life decisions into the work that I do with patient advocacy. And I've been tweeting and tweeting and tweeting. And the tweeting has been so profound because as you start talking about palliative care, people's stories and experiences start to come to the surface and those are so powerful. 
we had an initiative in optimizing different hashtags and one of my favorites that we used uh, on an e-patient ambassador level was humans of PC or humans of palliative care. There are so many, I encourage everyone to look up the hashtag humans of PC and there's so many amazing stories, powerful stories about the beauty and the change uh, uh, and the benefit of bringing palliative care into the paradigm as an extension of the care team. Uh, some of the benefits uh, were really getting to know who were the pioneers and really champions of palliative care. So in northern New Jersey, I as an advocate felt so alone because I wasn't connected to enough resources. There really weren't enough doctors that were doing palliative care. It's not a widespread thing and approach from my perspective, both personally as a, the caregiver to a breast cancer survivor and to disabled adults, um, as well as someone who has gotten a cancer diagnosis only to find out four months later that it was a misdiagnosis. Um, in speaking specifically with family, we've never been offered palliative care. Um, not during treatment, not in the short term. Uh, it was only about a year ago when I started this project that I felt confident enough to push now for my mom, who is a breast cancer survivor, to dive into getting palliative care for long-term, long-lasting side effects, and it's been incredibly helpful. Um, it's been so rewarding to be able to even connect with patients from uh, who are also leading the charge in palliative care, patients and advocates such as Adam Hayden and Liz Salmi, who I admire so much and have learned so much from, as well as having the opportunity to connect with different organizations in this space. Um, the Enwell Project or Death Over Dinner have been two that also have been extremely helpful. So that's uh, two years of work in a nutshell from my perspective, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later on. Great, thank you, Grace, very powerful. Let's move on to Sharon. Hi, I'm uh, Sharon Hall, and I am the care partner for my husband who has frontotemporal degeneration. Uh, dementia is, to me, very, very important for palliative care to be involved from the beginning for many reasons. Dementia is probably the most misunderstood thing that there is. No one realizes that it's just an umbrella term for losing cognition that affects your daily life and that the things underneath it that are actual diseases are many, and there are over 150 things that cause dementia. Very misunderstood. Uh, my husband's frontotemporal dementia is, is a young onset dementia. It is the number one dementia under the age of 60. And people do not understand that dementia is not just memory. So having a palliative team in place, first of all, I usually have to do a little educating of any medical professional uh, as far as dementia is concerned, and particularly frontotemporal dementia, uh, in order to sort of get them on board. No one realizes that someone 30 with young children in the home can have dementia. Uh, it affects their personality. So it's, it's very hard to make people understand that. We were very, very fortunate when my husband was diagnosed of at Emory, they have a special unit there called the Integrated Memory Care Clinic, which is a palliative care clinic only for those with dementia, and it is staffed by nurse practitioners. And it was a lifesaver for us. It, it even Recently, uh, we had to use them in the middle of the night, and we have 24-hour access and have the ability for them to walk us through very hard decisions in dementia. The first thing I always tell people, I speak a lot about dementia, particularly frontotemporal. Uh, the first thing I tell people when they're diagnosed is get your POAs, go to an elder law attorney, uh, and get support. And I'm telling them to get these documents in place as advanced directive. And I always suggest to them that they reach out for palliative care. Since my experience at the IMCC was so positive, and I didn't even realize that dementia would fall under palliative care. And I'm so happy that I became involved in this project because I have steered many, many families to palliative care who are now 
experiencing a much different journey in their dementia journey. So it, it was very important to me to learn all I could about palliative care so that I could be more involved in the dementia community. I do a lot online. I do a podcast. I, I do a, a bi-weekly chat with people with frontotemporal dementia. So I'm very active in the community, and I do a lot of speaking in my local community as well. And I have inserted palliative care in all of my dementia speaking. Uh, no matter what dementia you have, you really need to have palliative care. Sometimes it's a long journey. For frontotemporal dementia, it's not as long of a journey uh, because of the, the average lifespan for someone with frontotemporal dementia is five to eight years. So it's a much shorter term than someone with Alzheimer's. But regardless, families need support when they're dealing with a dementia diagnosis. Uh, we always say when you go to a neurologist and you're diagnosed, it's um, diagnose and adios. Uh, they sort of tell you to get your affairs in order and we'll see you in six months. Now they've told you that your person has this degenerative disease that will be fatal. You don't have any information on the progress of it or how it's going to progress. You don't really know, especially for those other dementias like frontotemporal and Dewey body, you're just out in the cold a lot of times. And uh, so it's so important that if if you could get the physician to understand that palliative care is not end of life, as Grace said, oftentimes our people have gone for palliative care, called someone with palliative care, and a lot of them do hospice as well, and are told, no, you don't qualify. Well, excuse me, but <laughs> this is a terminal diagnosis. There is no cure. There is no, you only do symptom management. So certainly it is a, a palliative care. It falls in the, into palliative care. So it, it's very important to me to get that information out to as many people within the dementia community, both professional and families, in order for them to understand that palliative care is for them and can make their journey so much easier on them and have so much more support. As we have here in Georgia, we now have five memory assessment centers, which are going to be diagnosing dementia. And it's important to get a proper diagnosis for dementia. And they are going to be diagnosing and then sending the person back to a primary care physician with a care plan. And I have become involved in the um, dementia world here in Georgia, and, and, and I'm on a committee that deals with the state plan, and I have encouraged them to look at the fact that they need to have a palliative team within those MACs to re or to refer out to a palliative team close to the family because it's been so incredibly report important for me. The other avenue I have taken, both with palliative care and, and, and telling people about dementia, is within the community are professionals like first responders mental health communities, they don't know about palliative care. They don't know about dementia. So they get that education. And then when I say they should be in palliative care upon diagnosis, everyone says, but that's for end of life. So I found it to be quite interesting how many people did not understand what palliative care was, even in the professional community. And to me, it is family oriented. It is something that helps that family get through difficult things like advanced directives and having the support of someone uh, that they can call and say, oh, bad day. Is there somebody I can talk to? I mean, there's, there's just so much that can help in the palliative world that uh, for a, a family with dementia. So it's a devastating diagnosis. I, I said when we got our diagnosis, it was both relief and grief. It was relief because I understood then that my husband wasn't being the way he was because of him. It was because of a degenerative disease. So that was a relief. But on the other hand, there was a great deal of grief. 
And now I knew that I was going to lose my husband sooner than I thought I would. So that it's one of the things that you need support. You need somebody that knows the disease. You need someone to be able to be there for you. And that's why palliative care was so important for us and why I try to share that. I'm now also on the committee in the state for palliative care. Uh, they have a palliative care group that's uh, in the state of Georgia that promotes palliative care. So I'm now on that committee to have the patient voice there to say, you really aren't getting the word out as much as you should. So uh, I'm, I was very happy to be part of this. I did a YouTube video with a palliative physician on dementia just to talk about how dementia is important in the, just to talk about how palliative care is so important in the dementia community. And um, that received quite a bit of, of um, feedback. I also have done some articles in uh, the association newsletters about palliative care and dementia. But this project has propelled me forward to not give up on people knowing about palliative care and to challenge their doctor if the doctor says, you're not ready for palliative care, to challenge them and say, yes, I am. I have a terminal diagnosis and we need the help. So I believe that patients can really drive this train in, into the station. And I was very happy to be involved in this project and get myself more involved in palliative care. I'd be happy to answer any other questions about dementia or how it works with palliative care at the end. And uh, it was just a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Sharon. That's a great reminder to put any questions in the Q&A or chat box. And as you can see, these are really amazing people that um, participated in this project and did so much to help spread the word. Um, let's move to Mary and the next slide. Uh, I live in Prairieville, Louisiana. And uh, I actually came to the CCCC website quite by accident and uh, saw about this EM patient ambassador program. I was curious about what it was because I had been diagnosed with a lifelong infection uh, after a long hospital stay. Uh, I went in for an aneurysm and valve repair and uh, actually caught a uh, superbug called Pseudomonas uh, during that. And uh, it's a chronic infection uh, that gives you endocarditis and lives in your system. So uh, I was curious as to what they were doing, and I was curious about what palliative care was. So I started researching the site, looking up what the actual system was about and what it entailed, and I was very intrigued because it was something that I feel I should have had, um, had never heard of before, had never even been offered at a hospital. Uh, my husband was with me all those 60 days. Uh, when I left the hospital, I couldn't walk. I couldn't hold anything in my hand. Uh, it was likely as a result of the septic shock. And um, we received no help at home. Uh, there were home infusions. Um, you know, that if he had a question, he could just call the hospital, but nobody came to see us, call to check on us, offer us advice. Uh, I didn't even know the infection was permanent until a month later when I went to see my infectious disease so it was very confusing. Um, I signed up for this program and attended a conference and learned a lot more about it and was very excited to get started. Um, we I'm very active on social media because I am a public speaker on uh, acquired infections. And so we started uh, getting information on how to share this discussion about palliative care should be not just for the dying, but can really be given a point of diagnosis to help extend life and make life better uh, for somebody with a chronic disease. And uh, we started our program uh, discussing it on social media and pushing forth a little bit to people we connected with and that connected with us um, about that palliative care can really improve quality of life and it should not just be for dying. And there's so many connections the hospice and palliative care, and I think that's part of the problem, uh, you tying those two together. Uh, I did find that Twitter was probably the best 
um, communication tool. People were very active on there and discussed things. Uh, I also shared um, and connected with people in the palliative care industry on LinkedIn. Uh, also shared the discussions on my company Facebook page uh, for discussions. And uh, LinkedIn and the Facebook page never really received much response or much action. Um, very few likes, very few reads. Uh, even from the people in the industry. And so I really concentrated more on Twitter. It seemed to be a lot more effective. Um, tried to get into hospitals uh, to talk to palliative care teams, and that was very difficult. Um, it was almost a complete shutdown. And I even had an in at some healthcare facilities. So we continued this, and I really feel we did change some views. Uh, I do think it's a program that needs to be ongoing. It's a battle that needs to keep being fought. And it's something that we need to keep bringing up and bringing up uh, to kind of pull it away from dying only. I think it's very important uh, what, what it does. And uh, with the recent coronavirus outbreak, uh, it's kind of taken a back seat uh, in the beginning. But I think we did see more discussion on uh, palliative care teams and hospitals being called into action because these patients in the hospital were dying without family. Uh, there were no visitors, often just one doctor in the room or one nurse in the room. Um, so at that point, it's kind of tied back to dying again, but there was, that was something that could not be prevented. I mean, these people that were on ventilators likely did not make it. And I think it was very important to have a compassionate ending uh, to their life. So uh, it, did, it did kind of take the conversation away from giving it at point of diagnosis. But I do know that some COVID patients have a lot of after effects. There's been some discussion about that. So I think it's very important that palliative care still be discussed um, because it's something that a corona survivor may need. Uh, I know that insurance companies are not on board with offering it early, and uh, I did connect with some insurance companies, and this is something that we need to bring attention to so that they will cover this, so that people can get that spiritual care, nutrition, decision-making assistance, and all the help they need to navigate their uh, diagnosis and what they're stuck with. So uh, I think it, the program needs to continue on. I, I hope there's a next group of ambassadors, and I feel it's very important uh, what the California Coalition for Compassionate Care is doing. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that recording from Mary. So Shelly, mm -hmm. take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Shelly Reinhardt, and um, I am a, I was a caregiver to my brother, my brother Jeff. He was diagnosed inoperable stage four colorectal cancer when he was 30 years old. And the doctor told us um, at diagnosis that there was no hope and no cure for his disease. And um, Jeff said, you know, it's fine. I'm going to fight. I'm going to beat this thing. And my family immediately went to Dr. Google, as many people do, to find out what we could expect and what we could learn and what was out there. Um, nothing prepared us for Jeff's cancer journey, though. Um, he, started, he started chemo, and we were aware that his hair would thin considerably, and we knew about the nausea and vomiting we did not know about the significant weight loss that he would experience. He lost 80 pounds in about two and a half months. Um, and we talked to his oncologist about it and the doctor said, well, we got to get him to eat. Um, but everything had a metallic taste and everything was too hot or too cold. He became worse than Goldilocks. We also had pain management issues. Um, Jeff was in incredible pain. And we would get it under control, or he'd, and then he'd have to go into the hospital. And um, in the hospital, he was seen by a hospitalist who didn't understand Jeff's diagnosis and didn't understand how to manage pain. So 
we would argue with this doctor constantly every time Jeff was in and just beg him, please read his chart, please just read the chart and look what you did last time. Um, and it wasn't until a nurse pulled us aside one day and said, you know, there's a doctor you can get that would just help him and help you guys manage his pain. And we were floored. We, I mean, who was this wizard? We didn't know anything about this. Um, and once we got Jeff um, with this pain management physician, he ne we never had issues with pain again. We also had issues with insurance navigation. Jeff, um, when Jeff went into the emergency room on his day of diagnosis, my mom called his employer and said, you know, Jeff's in the emergency room. He's not going to come into work today. And they said, we're so sorry. Um, he's, he's in our prayers. Please keep us updated. The next day um, after he was diagnosed, she called and said he's been diagnosed with cancer and we're going to learn more about it. But it's looking like he may not be into work for a little while. And they said, we're so sorry to hear that. Um, you're, you're in our prayers. Jeff was in the hospital for a total of three days. When we got home from the hospital on the third day, there was a note from his employer saying that he was now moved from full time to on call, which by the end of December, he would lose his insurance and he was welcome to join COBRA. And so we called the insurance and found out that COBRA would last only so long. Um, and then one day when chemo had been going on for a while, we got a call from his doctors, the oncology office, and they said that his insurance declined the treatment. And we had no idea why. So we called the insurance and found out that Jeff no longer had that insurance. And we said, well, why not? We paid the money. And they said, well, his employer has elected to change insurances. So we called his employer and found out they had changed to an insurance that none of Jeff's doctors took. Um, and it was very scary because Jeff had just been given the no evidence of disease and we were very excited and he had, he had opted to continue chemo. He wanted to kick it while it was down, his words. And um, the new insurance, those doctors, when they saw him, never gave him a single chemo treatment. They said he was stage four and therefore terminal. Um, at one point, after months of fighting and arguing, begging them to do anything, they basically looked at my brother, who was 32 at the time, and said, you just need to go home and start making plans. Um, through all of that, nobody mentioned any help or anything to us. It was my parents and I doing research, finding Marinol to help him get his appetite back, um, do, just doing different things. And at no time did anybody, uh, a medical professional or even my parents or I, ever worry about his mental state. Uh, by accident, we ended up finding a cancer support community a few months after diagnosis. and. Um, Jeff kind of found his tribe and his people, and we kind of found ours as well, but we did not talk about the difficulties being a caregiver and the, the mental toll that took on us. I never told my family about the nightmares I was having. Um, Jeff's cancer was genetic. Um, I'm sure those of you who understand a 30-year-old diagnosed with inoperable stage four colorectal cancer, it had to have been genetic. And I had nightmares every night until I found out that he self-mutated in March and I did not have it and neither did my parents. And it never occurred to me that those nightmares were linked to being so scared that I had cancer. Um, I am now a mother of three. And when I was pregnant, I saw a geneticist each time because I wanted them to assure me that my kids did not have a greater risk of developing this type of cancer um, and that no new information came out about it. Any time any of us goes in for a screening, a colonoscopy or any kind of cancer screening, the fear that is there. Um, and then 
the after effects. Jeff passed away five years after his diagnosis. And we didn't, we as his family, in our heads, we know that we did everything that we could and that we did everything that we could with the tools that are available to us. Our hearts are always doing the shoulda, coulda, woulda. If we'd have known this, we, we could have done this. We should have pushed harder for this. Um, I heard about palliative care after Jeff passed. Um, I became a, an, an advocate for cancer patients. And through the Palliative Care and Hospice Education Training Act, we were being trained on what that was. And when I found out what palliative care was, I got very excited. And I told my mom, I said, oh, mom, listen to this, what this, what Jeff could have really benefited from this. Because even though he lived that five years, he wasn't really living. He was breathing, he was surviving, but he wasn't really living his very best life. Um, so, and I thought it was new, you know. And then when I found out that it wasn't new and it was available for Jeff, but just never offered. And in fact, one of the places where Jeff was seen um, they have one of the best palliative care facilities in my area, and it was never offered to him, I found out, because of his age, being in his early 30s. And it got, it got me angry because I thought, you know, you guys acknowledged he was terminal. You acknowledged that he was going to die, but instead of helping him live his best life and making those years count, he was he was very ill for those five years um so as an as an e patient ambassador and as an advocate i have found that my best way of getting my point across i mean i'm not a medical professional i'm a teacher by profession um is to just tell my cancer story my brother's cancer story that age and stage of cancer do not matter. It's more of the fact that you have this disease and that it's going to change your life. And there are things we can do. There are things that the medical community can do um, that can help you. I've also done in-person speaking engagements um, with tissue because no matter how many times I tell my story, it's always difficult um, but being an advocate has helped because I feel like by getting his story out there um, it accomplishes a couple things one his biggest fear was that he didn't live long enough to matter um, that he was going to be forgettable because dying at 35 36 years old actually you know nobody really he didn't do anything um, and uh, by telling his story, I make sure that somebody remembers him. Also, in the hope that it can bring about change so that my kids or your kids or even you or I don't have that same cancer story that somebody can help and somebody can say you know what it doesn't matter that you're young or even it doesn't matter that you're old you still have the right to live your best life and we shouldn't worry about your comfort until you're dying you should you should have the right to be comfortable no matter what meeting these wonderful women who are my uh e-patient ambassadors as well has also helped me um build me up in what I'm doing and give me a little more strength in in carrying on. I found out um, using Twitter that, you know, palliative care just still has that stigma so much in the medical community that people have changed it to calling it supportive care. Um, and using, and as Grace said, using that hashtag humans of PC really meant a lot to me because I think at the very bottom of it all, it doesn't matter um, what you do for a living and how old you are and how sick you are, but we're all human and we all deserve 
that palliative care component to our treatment. So that was my learning process. Such a powerful story, Shelley. Thank you so much for sharing that journey that you went on with your brother and how it continues on in some ways. And of course, I'm willing to answer any questions later. I just want to share with you, we did get a comment. I'm sorry for your loss. You are a resilient person and thank you for sharing your journey with Jeff. Thank you. Sharon, um, we got a question. What is the name of your podcast? Uh, my podcast is Talking FPD, stands for Frontotemporal Dementia, and uh, I have it on Podbean, and I have about almost four years worth of recorded podcasts there about specifically frontotemporal dementia, but oftentimes it pertains to all dementias. There are some things that are unique in FPD, but uh, the podcast has helped people with just any dementia. Thank you. Um, we also have a question about whether you also um, refer people, patients and their caregivers to respite care. Uh, yes. Uh, when when I talk to people that have been diagnosed, I always tell them COVID has changed a lot, but I always and have always been a person who took four nights of respite every three months. And um that, to me, keeps you going as a dementia caregiver. It's a very difficult job. Uh, Dr. Bruce Miller out at UCSF has called FTD caregiving the hardest job in the world. Uh, that's because our people have the personality issues and are disinhibited and many things can happen. So uh, that I always tell people that. So always take rest that my husband also, without COVID, attends a day program and that is extremely helpful for me to have day time to uh, get my my things done my medical appointments and so forth so yes respite high on the list yeah one of our attendees is a social worker who's interned in the er and icu and just reminding us um, that the important role that social workers can play in palliative care and sometimes, you know, getting that referral to social work is a great way to start. Although I'm a clinical health care chaplain with a specialty in palliative care by training, I'm also a person with serious illness and a care partner for family members. I was drawn to this work through my direct experience. Towards the end of my father's life 28 years ago, I remember having the thought, hospice is wonderful. So much suffering could be relieved if this type of care began years earlier, closer to the time of diagnosis, and not just at the brink of death. And in those days, palliative care wasn't an option. We all recognize that no one welcomes chronic pain or stress, illness or injury, life transitions or loss, and that as a culture, we're used to going to the doctor to heal our bodies. Often our other needs, our psychological, our social, and our spiritual needs that are impacted by illness are totally left out of the equation. And when we face into illness and other life uncertainties, we often have questions. We may feel fear, denial, or disbelief. We may feel lost and unsure. We want to be seen and heard as a whole person, not just a disease. And some of us want to have our values and beliefs considered as we make treatment choices that affect our lives. We want to be part of that decision-making process. We want a team of experts and specialists to support us so we don't feel we're alone in dealing with all the other stresses and challenges that illness brings. And that's what a palliative care team can offer in both inpatient acute care settings and as an outpatient and community-based setting. No matter what your age or stage in a serious illness, palliative care focuses on preserving, enhancing, and achieving the best possible quality of life. It helps people, and it's based on what matters most to them and what makes their life worth living. Much of the work of palliative care team depends on taking the time to slow down and listen to the hopes and fears, 
the desires and concerns of the person with serious illness and their family members. Often this alone provides the opportunity for a felt sense of ease and well-being to arise and bring deep relaxation, comfort, and relief. For the person with serious illness, palliative care, which can be provided along with curative treatment, recognizes that you are more than your body, more than your diagnosis, and wish to live as well as possible for as long as possible. For the family and care partners, palliative care recognizes that serious or life-threatening illness carries with it significant burdens of suffering for people with serious illness and their families. That physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, and practical day-to-day -day stressors of serious illness exist and also need to be dealt with for healing. For other healthcare clinicians and teams, Palliative care creates a bridge of interdisciplinary connection and supports the patient's other medical generalists and specialists who are providing life-prolonging and curative therapy to the patient if so wished. While the medical, nursing, and social work members of the palliative care team are easily embraced, sometimes people are afraid of meeting the spiritual care team member. Simply stated, spiritual care nurtures the human spirit in coping with change or crisis. The palliative care chaplain is a specialist trained to honor all spiritual and religious diversity, helping align treatment and life choices with the person's values, spiritual beliefs, and the quality of life they desire. They provide comfort, support, and mobilize the person's own deep resources for coping and healing as well as emotional and spiritual growth. When illness arises, speaking with a spiritual care chaplain can help a person explore questions of meaning and purpose, of life and death, and the way they experience their connection to the moment, to themselves, to others, to nature, and to the significant or sacred, however it manifests to them. Palliative care focuses on what matters most, whether it's finding psycho-spiritual support, relief of physical symptoms, emotional support, or helping your family support system or friends understand more about you, your prime concerns, and your desires for care. Palliative care helps prioritize those things that improve your and your family's quality of life and formulate a supportive, holistic plan for documenting your wishes for care. If you can't speak for yourself, an advanced directive, perhaps the pulse, and assess in helping a healthcare representative as a surrogate to represent your wishes. Palliative care is simply a medical specialty that provides intensive caring rather than intensive care. It supports the person with a serious illness and the family as a unit. It recognizes that what affects one affects all and casts a wider net to extend emotional and spiritual support beyond the patient and their family to other health care team members and staff. I believe that palliative care embraces the opportunity to be with each person, family member and caregiver in our shared and common humanity in this most sacred and vulnerable of times. Great, thank you for that powerful message from Celine. I know we're pretty close to one o'clock. So we're gonna get through this quickly and we'll hang on for a little bit so we can have some more questions and answers uh, with our e-patients for those who can stay on. So a couple of lessons learned is one, some of these are people who have serious illness. So they are dealing with serious illness and you kind of keep that in mind um, with their capacity about their energy and their availability and others are caregivers, which is a full-time job in and of itself. Um, we did pay them all to participate because we were asking for a fair amount of time and participation. So um, we put together an application and promoted that and um, they did all apply. Um, we didn't have as much participation as we expected, but I think it's because the level of engagement and commitment we were asking for. Um, and even though we, you know, people were being compensated, we also had to think about some people were on um, disability or they had other programs that we needed to make sure that we didn't um, jeopardize funding they were receiving through other mechanisms. 
Um, all of our e-patients are across the U.S. They're in different time zones, which made it a little bit hard um, to gather them all on a call together. Um, some were working and some were not. Um, and also with training, we, they came much more ready than we expected. We were anticipating doing a lot of training, and we really did not need to do a whole lot. One, they already um, knew, many of them knew about positive care. Um, they knew how to get themselves educated. Um, most of them were already pretty active on social media, but we did offer um, supplementary education through um, recorded webinars, um, and also they all attended our annual conference, which gave them a real immersion into the whole palliative care community. Um, they met with each other, and that cross-pollinization that happened, that relationship building, as well as cross-pollinization with the palliative care community was very helpful. So we have put together a toolkit for those who would like to do something similar with e-patients. And you can hear Mary is making the case on the call that there's so much value to continuing to have um, e-patients engaged and being the messengers on this. So please check that out. And just a quick pitch that the coalition, next slide, that's where you can find it. Um, has put together our COVID Conversations Initiative. Next slide, you, you can find on our website. So I've got a couple of questions here. I'm actually going to combine them into one question for our patients, and I'll open it up to all of our e-patients. But um, we have one comment about how Medicare Advantage programs don't consistently provide access to palliative care for everybody who would benefit. And then also, um, passionate, articulate statement that in all of these stories, we hear learning, in all of these stories, we are learning these advocates um, that healthcare providers are not telling, are telling them that patients don't qualify for palliative care or the clinicians are not aware of it. And these advocate voices are so powerful. How do we bridge the gap between the patient voices and stories and healthcare providers and I would add to that what I said in the beginning, the Medicare Advantage plans, I think, are likewise. So how, how do we bridge that gap? So Grace or Sharon or Shelley, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. So this is Grace. I would recommend looking into perhaps telemedicine consults. A lot of red tape has been broken and relaxed because of COVID-19. And at least in this short-term future, uh, there's a lot more avenues that have been opened up for allowing patients who are sheltering at home to access more doctors and more care via telemedicine. And there is more reimbursement available that normally pre-COVID uh, was not the case. That was a significant barrier to different types of telemedicine care that could be available. Yeah, this is Sharon, and uh, I, I think it's very, every time I speak, I, when Todd was in the hospital, we, <laughs> we had daily little uh, conferences about both uh, dementia and palliative care, and it's amazing to me how many healthcare professionals do not know what palliative care really is, and so many assume, so many primary care physicians just assume that it's end of life. And that, to me, was probably the most significant thing that I learned. I just thought, well, all the doctors know, but they're just not telling us. They don't. And uh, so I, I think it's really important for not only the e-ambassadors, as far as those of us that are involved with someone that is getting value of care speak, but also to educate primary care physicians, because I'm here to tell you they don't know. And uh, I do speak to them a lot primarily because they don't know about dementia either. And that that's a really gaping hole as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is Shelley. Uh, being somebody who didn't even know what palliative care was, um, we didn't know to ask for it. So I don't know if Jeff's insurance would have covered it. They had no problem when we asked about the pain management specialist. Um, they just didn't, um, we didn't know to ask for anything else or any help with anything else because we just didn't know that such a thing existed. 
looking back now, I would say it's a it's a training issue, a continuing education issue, um, and getting doctors to understand the importance of palliative care and how I feel that it might have actually made the, the job of Jeff's oncologist easier because we could have gone to the, the, the palliative care specialists for the issues with weight loss and the issues with um, pain and the issues, you know, just the many other issues with the, he had blood issues and um, he is lot, lots of different issues. Um, as for the insurance needs, we scrambled. He ended up getting covered with um, his regular insurance and he had Medicare. But um, like I said, I, I am actually 100% sure that everything, all palliative care stuff would have been covered if we'd have had the knowledge to ask for it. I think I have to just chime in one more thing. I think the bigger component here to emphasize is that knowledge of palliative care and pressing for it and, and asking for it as an extension of the care team and then working collectively to find um, is this something that can be made available or how can it be covered? Yeah, well stated. I'm going to have I think a question here. I was just going to say pushing is, is very important from a from a uh, advocate point of view of someone, uh, an advocate who is a care partner, pushing help. And, uh, and that I would say, I've told all my people who said they couldn't get palliative care to go back and say, yes, they can. Absolutely. So it sounds like it's kind of a rippling effect of empowering people. Um, this initiative was to empower you, and in turn, you felt that it was really key to empower other people so that they can get access to this um, with them, for themselves or their loved ones. Um, we have another question here that uh, attendees wondering if any of your loved ones had an advanced directive prior to being diagnosed um, or after being diagnosed and kind of your thoughts on advanced care planning, did having an, if they had an advanced directive, did it help with guiding their care or seeking out for their support? I can go. Um, um. Jeff was 30, um, so no, he did not. Uh, he got one in, he, we did one in the hospital right after he was diagnosed. Um, but it wasn't probably as detailed as it could have been. Um, and we didn't know to go back and do a recheck and we didn't know the types of questions that we should have been asking him. Um, and at the and we, we I know I'd never even heard of a pulse at all um, until I went to the conference last year. I had no idea what that was. And I think it would have helped because um, when Jeff was at the end of his life, they had him on morphine and his you know, blood pressure was really high because of the pain and the discomfort. And they said, we could raise his morphine to make him more comfortable, but it will kill him faster. And I was like third in line for um, the advanced directive. My parents, of course, had, you know, first dibs on any medical situations. And my mom had to say, I want him comfortable, knowing that her son, she was taking time off of her son's life. And I don't, I don't think anything really prepares you for that. So knowing, knowing that and knowing what I know now, I push for people when they get to that that place to get a pulse so that way it takes the, 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 that away from their loved one of having to make that decision and say those words. But no, Jeff was 30, so he thought he was going to live forever until we did, he found out he wasn't. I'm sorry. 
we do have a we do have an advanced directive had it before rod was diagnosed and uh subsequently we have gotten a post and ironically he was just in the hospital with pneumonia and the physician the hospitalist there called me and was sort of dancing around advanced directive issues and i said that he had a post and the words were what's a post so a lot of information needs to be out there in all communities and uh, please talk please talk those of us that have people that are in this situation need you to talk so we know about it and one last question do you have any thoughts about what platforms on social media worked best and what messages um, resonated the most with people. I'll go. Oh, this is so, oh sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. I already uh, I volunteer with the American Cancer Society and the Cancer Action Network, so I already had a large Facebook community with cancer. So the converse, they, and many of them already knew my story even across the country. Um, so a lot, of it, a lot of the, did you know about palliative care? Did you know you could ask for palliative care? Those kinds of posts um, went well on Facebook just because that was the, the audience already knew me. On Twitter, um, I had more difficulties personally because I was like, I have to tweet and I have to do a hashtag and what? And um, there were so many times I would write a tweet and then forget the hashtag and then I'd have to go delete the tweet and do the hashtag all over again. So I was new to Twitter at the beginning of this, new-ish to Twitter. Um, but what worked best for those were little tidbits of the palliative care that my brother didn't get. And then, um, you know, talking about changing the conversation of palliative care to um, age and stage to age and stage don't matter. It's that diagnosis, that's what matters, and that's what qualifies those people to get palliative care. And I was just going to say that uh, Facebook was one of my major uh, avenues as well because I belong to a lot of dementia community support closed groups for people that are caring for someone with dementia and uh, that that was the most effective uh, besides talking about it on my podcast and doing the uh, YouTube with a palliative physician on dementia uh, those those really got the best traction even when I posted them in Twitter so telling our stories is really important it's important for us to tell our stories so that people relate I think that's really important. Grace, do you want to add anything? I think everyone has done such a powerful job of summarizing the fact that by emphasizing and sharing our personal stories, and I, I love what Shelly said of what didn't happen and what could have happened, and that there's just no question here of the benefit of palliative care. And the more we talk about it, the more awareness, we amplify the power of the difference it makes in people's lives and the suffering that could have been prevented. Because at the end of the day, we're all just walking each other home and how can we all best do that while preserving the sanctity of do no harm. Great, thank you all today. And thank you for our attendees who have uh, called in today and listened to this and stuck with us through um, our additional questions and answers. I want to give a big thank you to our speakers for a great presentation and great conversation today. And thank you also for the work that you've been doing with this whole engagement initiative over the last year and a half plus. And um, we're kind of here at the culmination of it. It's bittersweet, so sweet for what has been accomplished. Um, but we know that we will continue to stay in touch with you. And uh, just a reminder to the attendees that you will be getting an email with a link to the slides. And um, again, thank you for being on our 
webinar today, and thank you to all of our speakers. Have a great day, and be safe. Bye-bye.